Um, we've got an A-list panel for you here today, an A-list panel at the end of the day. And rather than have a series of PowerPoint presentations and, uh, and speeches, I'm going to try and keep things very conversational. I'm going to introduce everybody briefly. I've, I, with apologies, I have cut your bios uh, by about two-thirds. <laughs> But I'm going to introduce everybody individually. I'm going to ask them one question, and that is, what is the largest challenge facing our economies outside the I-5 corridor? And after we've run through the seven people here, then we're going to move over into a more conversational mode with a series of questions that, uh, that we prepared in advance. You know, this is a big group. Uh, I came in here earlier. I saw that there were six chairs, and I thought, I've got seven people. We're going to have to uh, play the Oregon uh, uh, State song, and at the end of the music, whoever doesn't have a chair is going to be off the panel. But, uh, but we were actually able to add one more chair up there. One more thing I want to say by way of introduction. And am I coming through clearly in the back? Can you hear me? Very good in the back? All right. So much of what we have been talking about this week and, uh, and actually uh, in the events leading up to this week has focused on what we term the urban-rural divide here in Oregon, the urban-rural divide. And I, can I say just right here and now that, that I reject that terminology? Uh, and, and I reject that terminology for reasons that you may not think. It's because so often when I hear that phrase, what I am hearing by inference is the I-5 corridor and points east of the I-5 corridor. But I'm working with the Coastal Caucus, representing communities up and down the Oregon coast and the coast range. And we are a little different. We are an interesting merge, merge of urban and rural um, ideology. Because we have our rural roots. No question, we have our rural historical roots. But we also have an awful lot of urban transplants whether they are coming to us um, to, uh, to start businesses, create jobs, or to take jobs, or whether they're coming to us in retirement. In my own district, 25% uh, of the population is over the age of 65. And that's growing every day compared to about 15% statewide. So, so this affects our economies, or it affects our communities, and it affects our politics. And when we talk about the urban-rural divide in Oregon, often we're talking about what we call red Oregon and blue Oregon. I come from purple Oregon. I come from Purple, Oregon, so that affects so much of what we do as well. So I was so very pleased to see when, uh, when this program was put together that it didn't talk about urban and rural distinctions. It talked about economies outside the I-5 corridor. And so that's what we're going to zero in on today. And as I said, I'm going to introduce each of our panelists individually. I'm going to ask them that introductory question, what is the greatest challenge facing economies outside the I-5 corridor? And then we're going to move into a more conversational mode where the seven of us can fight over our, uh, our two microphones. <laughs> so let me start um, with Lori Steele. Lori is the director of West Coast Seafood Processors. Uh, she um, um, the West Coast Seafood Processors is a trade association that represents shore-based seafood processing companies throughout Oregon, Washington, and California. And their member companies process the majority of Dungeness crab, pink shrimp, and a variety of fish caught in West Coast commercial fisheries. Her educational background is also focused on fisheries. She holds a BS in marine science and biology from the University of Miami and a master's degree in coastal environmental management from Duke University. Lori currently lives in Portland, Oregon, where the OCSPA is based. So Lori, what's the biggest challenge facing us outside the I-5 corridor for our local economies? Um, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for having me on the panel. Um, since you already did my introduction for me, um, I guess everybody knows that I'm representing all of the um, seafood processing companies. Um, up and down the West Coast and in the state of Oregon, um, that's really where the seafood industry is concentrated. Um, we have more processing plants here in Oregon than in uh, California and Washington, at least in terms of West Coast fisheries. Um, it's really uh, difficult to identify the single biggest challenge. Um, seafood processing and the seafood industry in general, I think, faces a lot of unique challenges because we are right on the land-sea interface and um, really deal with a lot of regulatory challenges from, from all directions. Um, I guess the biggest challenge that the seafood processing sector is facing right now um, in this area 
area is um, being able to keep, uh, find and, and maintain skilled labor. Um, it's something we've already heard a lot about today. Um, I think for the seafood industry, it's not simply an education issue, um, or it may not be directly tied as much to education. There are a lot of reasons why uh, we are struggling with um, keeping labor in the processing plants. Some of it is related to um, supply. Uh, a lot of it is related to housing and the cost of housing in these communities. So it's a little bit of a, a different issue for us, but labor is a very, very significant issue. Um, followed very closely by um, the challenges associated with uh, maintaining infrastructure and wharfage in our coastal communities that have so many competing interests right now. Excellent. Well, thank you, Lori. And uh, here's a quick question for you. Um, what is the Oregon State crustacean? <laughs> now, come on. I'm a transplant. Um, I'm going to guess it's the Dungeness crab. All right. Thank you. Oh, my God. I would have been horribly embarrassed had I gotten that wrong. <laughs> well, our next panelist is, uh, is Pac Patrick Kreister. Uh, Patrick is the current president and CEO of the Tillamook County, Tillamook County Creamery Association, a role he has served in since 2012. Prior to that, he spent nearly eight years as the president and CEO of Coffee Bean International. A native Oregonian, uh, Patrick uh, also currently serves on the board of the Oregon Food Bank and is chair of the Oregon Business Plan. Um, pa Patrick recently joined uh, OCF, uh, the OCF Board of Directors. So, Patrick, again, the first uh, introductory question to you. Well, certainly, the I can I can uh, reinforce a lot of the challenges that have been identified here around uh, and, and in the previous panel around uh, workforce. I mean, if you drill down to that, uh, you know, the, the it's well-worn territory: housing, uh, access to services. Um, uh, education and, and, and other, um, you know, sort of quality of life kind of challenges associated with uh, with establishing uh, a necessary and skilled workforce. Um, in you know, the, we operate across the state with about 600 employees in uh, Tillamook County and two, around 200 in uh, Morrow County, and then almost 100 here in, in the Portland area. So we, we kind of, you know, I sort of reject the urban-rural divide for multiple reasons, but one is uh, how, in our unique position of looking across uh, the urban and rural landscape in Oregon, uh, we think there's a lot more opportunity uh, for those communities to work together than, than to be divided. But, you know, a couple of the other challenges, transportation certainly is a challenge. I know um, in, in, I think, in, in run-up to legislature's uh, consideration of a transportation package this year. Um, certainly there, there were interviews conducted in Tillamook and interestingly uh, our uh, farmers and, and those that are moving product around the county in Tillamook mostly pointed to Portland area transportation issues because we need to get the products through Portland obviously to get them around the country and around the world in general uh, from where we are at milepost zero. So uh, certainly transportation is an issue and then you know I think um, uh, the translation of well-intended policies uh, and resource allocation um, at the state level uh, uh, that, um, and how that translates to rural Oregon versus urban Oregon I think sometimes gets lost a little bit whether it be workplace zoning uh, other kind of um, you know other kind of policies and, and resource allocation uh, decisions that are made and uh, you know I know our representatives do a great job of, of making sure that our voice is heard and and we appreciate that um, I on, by the same token I'm an uh, you know eternal optimist and I think all the all the um, the challenges that we can identify related to uh, you know, related to the economies in in uh, rural Oregon can also be seen as strengths. I mean, we've certainly seen dislocation of industries as uh, conservation intentions have changed or public sentiment has changed or even technology and, and demand for certain uh, types of products have changed uh, but I do think that um, I do think that if we take a hard look at uh, rural areas and understand what what the real assets are there uh, largely natural resources but other assets as well that we can build industries kind of rebuild industries related to those those natural comparative advantages that exist in the rural areas of the state I also think these are great places to live so to the extent that we can overcome some of the challenges like uh, like housing and um, 
and you know services that uh, we're certainly looking at a younger generation that's interested in more than just work um, certainly work hard but but enjoy life and I think we can in rural Oregon we can play that to our advantage uh, as we uh, as we look to, to build those economies excellent thank you thank you Patrick and my question for you is what is the Oregon State drink I'm going with milk milk I don't know if that's true but milk <laughs> Probably All lose right. my job if I didn't say that, so I'm going <laughs> All right, our panel is two for two. I'd, I'd like to uh, introduce to you uh, Brian Harper. Brian was born in Nairobi, Kenya, but he is a fifth generation manager, fifth generation manager of Harper Farms, Inc. This family farm originally grew diversified row crops, including vegetables, seeds, essential oils, and timber. Recently, the farm was converted to growing hazelnuts. Brian attended the University of Oregon where he was a track athlete. He graduated with a BA in psychology. Brian was elected to the Lane County Farm Bureau in March 2017 and appointed to the Board of Agriculture in October 2016. When Brian isn't farming, he is flying and he flew down here today. So Brian, welcome and uh, again that, uh, that first question to you. Yeah, hey, thanks. Uh, yeah, so it's, uh, it's amazing. You know, thinking agriculture, it's in Oregon, it's, it's huge. Um, and in some ways, uh, a lot of folks are more disconnected now than ever, uh, unfortunately, from agriculture, forestry, ranching, uh, dairy. Uh, but they certainly expect a, a quality product. And more so now than ever, folks are wanting something farm to table. They care about where it's coming from. And Oregon has been known for quality. And right now, I think we're over 220 crops, latest one, cannabis. Uh, you compare that to uh, the Midwest, and you have the big three, and acres and acres and acres of it. But uh, almost gets to be an eyesore. But uh, you know, it, uh, unfortunately, the community uh, tends to think that's what agriculture looks like, because that's the one that's kind of the most obvious. It's the large you know, tracts of land with large buildings and silos. And a lot of times, they're kind of government subsidies and boy the equipment sure is pretty but you know here we're we're certainly on our own and uh, unfortunately as I've grown up and seen how the older folks in the game have farmed they tend to, they've kept themselves and they have not been willing to share their way of life and sort of put in a face and a name to the industry uh, despite the fact that we are doing the best we can with what we have and uh, producing has become more challenging as uh, producers have left. Um, or I'm, I'm, a, I'm a raw product producer. That's what I do. I pick them off the ground and send them to the market, and I hope they're going to, you know, staying local. But a lot of times, they're, you know, hazelnuts have gone mostly bulk, uh, you know, and and uh, exported. But as folks are certainly interested in, in that local quality product, we're, we're we're able to keep them here with uh, with food quality assurances. And and uh, essentially, my my goal as a fifth generation. Uh, 21st century millennial farmer, um, and I think I'm the youngest one in the room here. Possibly, uh, that's a good deal. That's a good deal. That's that. That is. I know. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> I take it back. I take it back. But you know, I I certainly want to. My goal is to keep Oregon special. You know, I think a lot of people like to look at it as weird. Uh, keep Oregon weird. I saw that coming in there on the Uber from the airport today, uh, and I thought oh, that's interesting. But uh, I, I think of it more special and and, and different, uh, but uh, certainly unique and uh, but of high quality. And uh, that's essentially my goal. The challenges I have to get back to the challenge part. Uh, the challenges we're facing are so broad. 220 different crops, and commodities. We are we face a lot of different challenges. Uh, production is one by far is, is a big one uh, you know and, and farmers being able to do a lot there on the farm it's it's there's fewer places that you can go to you know have your product handled uh, we're, we're getting to where we're producing in the hazelnut game at least there's a lot of trees in the ground as a lot of you see up and down i-5 but there's fewer places to be able to to, to, pr to process those nuts so uh, we're definitely you know the production side is facing some growing pains uh, kind of like a maybe a shoe company in its uh, infancy we see a few of those around here uh, we're definitely trying to find those growing pains you know and, and, and find kill stops for those so we can grow past them and and uh, push that ceiling higher but um, you know we're also labor is another one uh, Patrick he said a lot of them really for us and, you know labor is definitely challenging there's not too many Millennials that want to work you know that you know as we know as hard today as we used to. It's kind of more of a techno, uh, I call it a techno weenie industry uh, now these days, which is huge. I mean, I sort of like my iPhone. Um, I was able to navigate my way up from you know, Junction City from my little strip on the farm up to Hillsboro. So it's certainly, it's, it's huge and it's helped agriculture big time. Uh, we started out with, you know, horse-drawn everything and now we're running state-of-the-art equipment and, and precision, you know, spring, 
you know, irrigating, whatever it is. Um, but uh, you know, the, it, we're definitely trying to keep ourselves competitive globally so that we have something here to represent Oregon with, and that's that's becoming a challenge. And you know, it, it takes the policymakers as well as the farmers out there, boots on the ground, working together. And that's what I'm trying to bridge that gap. So, well, thank you, Brian. Uh, would uh, <coughs> would you happen to know what the Oregon State nut is? Well, there's not too many nuts here, other than maybe the walnut, and there's only about 200 acres down the road here, and I'd say it's got to be the filbert. I'm going to call it the filbert. It's probably the hazelnut. Uh, <laughs> they, 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 were, they we were only paid 35 cents or so for a filbert, but then they decided to pay us over a buck for a hazelnut, so we figured we'll call it whatever you want. <laughs> so here we are. <laughs> and that, folks, is why it's the state nut. <laughs> All right, thank you. I'm going to introduce now Grant Kitamura. General Manager of Murakami Produce. Uh, Gr Grant joined Mur Murakami Produce in, in Ontario in 1980 along with its founder, Sig Murakami, and they developed one of the region's largest volume onion packing and shipping operations. Grant was born in Ontario and raised on a family farm in Malheur County, a grandchild of Japanese immigrants who had been involved in vegetable production in the Pacific Northwest since the early 1920s. He graduated from Ontario High School and then Oregon State University with a bachelor's degree in business administration, accounting, and finance. Grant, welcome. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, when I first got the call to, uh, to participate on this panel, uh, uh, they said it was for the Oregon Coast Economic Summit. And I said, I think you've got the wrong guy. <laughs> and uh, then it was explained to me it was outside of the I-5 <coughs> corridor, and uh, I'm certainly outside of the I-5 corridor, 300, 376 miles to be exact. I drove it this morning. <laughs> And, uh, and and in a different time zone as well. <laughs> uh, anyhow, uh, to answer the question of uh, uh, the issues, we have a lot of issues, but uh, and I've been asked this question numerous times over the past year by very, very high-ranking people. Uh, uh, Cliff, our representative Cliff Benz brought uh, Speaker Tina Kotek over to Ontario. And she asked those questions. And, and, uh, and then uh, during our, uh, you must have heard about our snowmageddon in eastern Oregon with the major uh, snow pileups, uh, three feet, uh, building collapses, it's all true. And Kate, uh, Governor Kate Brown came to visit. I was her tour guide and showed her much of uh, the damage in Malheur County. And she asked me the very same questions. And believe it or not, the snow was just a current issue, but we've had long going uh, problems with a lot of things. Um, I'm in the onion industry. Uh, our region in Malheur County, uh, we raise 12,000 acres of onions by, with about 50 or 60 growers. Right adjacent is Idaho, we're right on the Snake River, they raise about 10,000 acres. Our region is called the Idaho Eastern Oregon region, and uh, this region provides roughly 40% of the national consumption of dry bulb onions between uh, uh, September and March of every year. It's a storage crop, we plant them in the spring, harvest in the fall, and uh, shipped during the whole winter. So it's uh, uh, that and cattle is the, they're the two major commodities. And of course, agriculture is the backbone of our uh, economy there. Malheur County is a very poor county. I heard a uh, representative speak earlier that she was the thir third poorest county. We're the first. We have that distinction. And uh, it's a very large county geographically, almost 10,000 acres, a little over 30,000 people. That's about three, peop three people per acre. <laughs> it's pretty, pretty sparse, and it's desert. So um, it's, uh, the ag is everything to the area, and um, our biggest problems, first of all, is transportation. We're so far from the markets. We don't ship onions west. The onions you get here in, in Portland are probably from Brooks, maybe Hermiston, but we're further away than that. All of our onions go east. They go east clear to the other side of the country in a lot of cases. Um, that's a real issue. When you're not near a populated area, you don't have the trucks. The trucks unload in the cities, the major populated areas, and they load there and go, go back. We, we, we have shortage of transportation. The main line of the Union Pacific comes there, but it's become fairly unreliable. Um, the second is, uh, we're neighbors to Idaho, and Idaho's laws are much more business friendly than Oregon's. And uh, 
We're in the same time zone. We're right across the river. I can see Idaho from my office. We're 55 miles from Boise, Idaho. I grew up thinking I, uh, the, the governor of Idaho was my governor. <laughs> I mean, that's the only TV we had, you know. But uh, uh, at any rate, uh, um, there's such an advantage, and there's such a boon going on in Idaho right now. The, the Boise Valley is growing by, I understand, 10,000 people a month. And there's building going on, houses going up, and here we are, 55 miles away, nothing going on. Um, we just, uh, land use planning has been kind of strict, and uh, we haven't had development. In fact, with the uh, entitlements that uh, are, are available in the state of Oregon, a lot of the poor people come to Oregon, and the more affluent go out. So it's not, it's not a very good scene. And these are uh, stories, or not stories, facts I shared with uh, Speaker uh, Kotak and the governor. And they said, we'll help you. And I, yeah, OK. <laughs> you know. And uh, you know they did. They did. Uh, along with Representative Bentz, um, uh, the uh, speaker and uh, the governor did help. Uh, and first of all, uh, so you're asking me how our, what our problems are and what our future looks like. Well, the future is much brighter for us in Mount Here County. Uh, with House Bill 2017, the, the transportation package included in, in that was a, a transload facility for Mount Here County, which is uh, our, uh, the ability to go bimodal, to load rail cars and unload at the destination in trucks to deliver with a dedicated train, which is might be three times faster than rail. It's dedicated, goes straight through to the East Coast or Chicago, New York. And so that's going to be a, a game changer for our industry. It'll save us. Uh, we've been competing with that up in Washington for a decade out, out of Wallula. They've had that service, and we have not. Uh, another game changer for us will be uh, House Bill 2012, which uh, made our part of our county an economic development region. And this remains to be seen yet. We're going to have the ability to talk to uh, the agencies and land uh, land use planners to hopefully lighten up on us. I mean, we're, we're sparsely populated. It's not like, you know, we're <laughs> going to take away someone's farm to build a bunch of homes. It's, I mean, for, for crying out loud, onions, I've been in the deal a long time. In the last 30 years, the, the, the ability to grow onions with the cultural practice improvements <coughs> and the varieties, our production is double per acre. We can raise twice as many onions per acre as we did 30 years ago. So hey, you know. We got plenty of land, sometimes not enough water. This year, too much water. <laughs> I don't think anybody can help us on that. But uh, the governor and speaker have done a wonderful job for, for us. And uh, I give them all the credit. Uh, we need to take the ball now and carry it and take care of things and get business done. But uh, those are the main problems. Uh, labor shortage is another. But maybe we can talk to the Department of uh, Human uh, Services and not take away the entitlements when people want to work for a seasonal job. You know, that's, that's kind of ridiculous. It's kind of uh, defeats the purpose. So well, thank you. Well, thank you so much, Grant. Um, yeah, I was going to ask you if you might happen to know the, uh, the new Oregon State pie, but I was afraid you might say onion. <laughs> um, so I wonder, being an Oregon Stater like me, if you know what the Oregon State animal is. I know it's not a duck. <laughs> 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 I'll, I'll take that as a correct answer. <laughs> All right. I'd now like to uh, introduce uh, Steve Thompson, for, uh, the CEO of uh, Christum Vineyards and the chair of the Oregon Wine Board. Uh, Steve is a native of the Chicago area and a graduate of the University of Illinois. He has 28 years of wine industry experience, which followed a successful 12-year career in, uh, in the restaurant and hotel industry as a food and beverage director. He was appointed to the Oregon Wine Board in 2012 by Governor Kitzhaber and reappointed for a second term in 2015 by Governor Brown. Steve serves now as chairman of the Oregon Wine Board and president of the Oregon Wine Growers Association. So Steve, same question to you about uh, the challenges facing economies outside the I-5 corridor. Thank you. Thank you, Representative 
Gomberg. It's great to be here on behalf of our Oregon wine industry. I, I wanted to just tell you a little bit about our industry because within those facts and points lie a lot of the challenges and opportunities uh, for our entire state and the opportunities. So one of my favorite quotes about the Oregon wine community came several years ago when U.S. Senator Ron Wyden addressed our Oregon Wine Growers Association annual meeting. I love this quote. He said, the Oregon wine industry is a relentlessly good news story for the state of Oregon. So the Oregon wine industry, just to, to put it in perspective, has moved onto the global stage in a big way in just 50 short years of existence. To put this in perspective, of the handful of world leading wine regions that Oregon wine competes with, many have been in existence for a thousand or more years. We've only been on the stage for 50 years. The Oregon wine industry has also become a unique economic engine drawing attention to our state globally, producing high value, high image sales and drawing high value food tourism back to Oregon. It raises the bar for most of our food products across the country and globally. Wine's economic impact in Oregon is $3.3 billion per year. Wine tourism generates statewide economic impact of approximately $225 million annually. When visitors come to Oregon, they're pulled from the cities and drawn to the wineries and then to the beautiful rural coast and mountains beyond where they spend money and they come back again. And they go home and they tell their friends about it. Oregon's wine sector is also distinctive in its capacity for generating economic activity in every single one of Oregon's 36 counties. Within the wine segment's current employment base. <laughs> within the wine segment's current employment base of about 17,000. 100 are 7,000 jobs located in rural communities, many of which are very high wage jobs. Oregon had 702 wineries and 1,052 grape growers in 2016. Nearly three quarters of Oregon wineries are small family businesses making fewer than 5,000 cases each year. Our industry marketing mechanism, the Oregon Wine Board, helps more than 200 of these wineries to sell their high value wines directly to more than 40 countries around the world. The annual wage base in the wine sector is just over 525 million. Actually across the state, wine businesses contribute property taxes to every Oregon community, totaling 65 million each year. There's still great opportunity ahead for our industry. Oregon sells 3 million cases of wine per year but that's only about 1% of the wine made in the U.S. Two of the top three wines in Wine Spectator Magazine's top 100 wines of the year for 2016 for the entire world were from Oregon. It's easy to grasp the economic multiplier effect of our wine industry well beyond the I-5 corridor, but there's some fragility to our present business environment. Oregon is a small population state and economic downturns can disrupt highly profitable direct tasting, tasting room, and in-state restaurant and retail sales and the tourism dollars in, in impacts generated by in the wider economy. Competition and consolidation in the wine and spirits industry around the world are making it much harder to reach markets across the country. Like many ag products, we are at risk for disease vectors, which must be mitigated by costly research. Um, labor, this is a very high value product and we can automate but what automation does, if we don't have the manpower, what automation does is it lowers the value of that wine. So instead of producing $50, $7,500 bottles of wine, when we automate, we're producing more bottles, but much smaller uh, value. And uh, you know, to give you an idea of the challenges we face globally, I just got a text a couple minutes ago. Year to date, our Export sales for the U.S. to Europe have gone down 15% in volume and 9% in value. So it kind of shows the fragility there. If we don't push our industry out, our industry is a giant engine that pulls dollars and in interest back to the state of Oregon. We need to take steps to protect and project our industry. And very importantly, 
To help ensure that we successfully mitigate these risks and challenges, the Oregon State Legislature recently passed House Bill 5006, which will allow our industry an extra $500,000 for the 2017-28 biennium, which the Oregon Wine Board will match with five to six dollars of the tonnage tax for every dollar provided by HB 5006. So this is an industry where we really rely on, again, most of our wineries are very small wineries. We put them on the global stage. And the help and support of our state legislators and our, our, our partners across all the different food and, and uh, the different kind of sectors that impact our business is huge for pushing brand Oregon forward across the world in bringing dollars back to Oregon. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Steve. I have a bit of a trick question for you. Um, could you tell us what the Oregon State flower is? <laughs> well, could it be the grape blossom? It's the Oregon grape. <laughs> The Oregon State Flower, who'd have thought? <laughs> well, I'd, uh, I'd now like to introduce Bruce Hanna, president of Timber Country Bottling in Roseburg. Uh, Bruce is a second generation Coca-Cola bottler, is president of Timber Country Coca-Cola Beverages, and he is also the president of, um, of their sister company, Automatic Vending Service, a full line vending company. Bruce served as a state representative from 2004 through 2014, including four years as the House Minority Leader and two years as co-speaker of the Oregon House during the historic Tide legislative session where he was co-speaker together with Arnie Roblin, uh, who's here in the room as well. Bruce is a graduate of Northwest Christian University and served as a member of their Board of Trustees for eight years. He and his wife, Teresa, live in Roseburg, Oregon. So. Speaker Hanna. Thank you, Representative. Very nice to be here this evening with you. I know uh, it's always tough to be the end of the day, and we hope we can keep things lively, as you mentioned. Um, I, I want to tell you just briefly about Timber Country Coca-Cola Beverages. We're a regional beverage supplier in Southern Oregon. Um, when we talk about rural, I always have to remind people in Atlanta, Georgia, where the Coca-Cola Company is headquartered, that we're not just rural. We're rural and frontier. We cover um, Douglas, Coos, Curry, Josephine, Jackson, Klamath and Lake Counties, and, uh, and Del Norte and Siskiyou Counties in Northern California. So when you talk about us off the I-5 corridor, other than Douglas, Josephine, and Jackson, everything we do is in rural and frontier Oregon. And so we, we understand that, we know those communities, we know the leaders of those communities, and we strive to be a huge component of economic growth in those communities. Um, the question as it's posed I think is interesting and I appreciate that, that everyone's answer is, is somewhat the same and a little bit different, but I'm gonna give you a little different perspective from my view and I think my view is, is made up both as a business person who, who operates a business in those communities and having been in the Oregon legislature to participate and listen to all of the people who come and give us information. And I, I heard a comment uh, among the earlier panel today and, and, and it was lighthearted, so, so whoever said it, I, I, I'm not picking on them, but the EIEIO of who comes to see you, right, in the Oregon legislature. Um, I'm not worried about that, and I hope as legislators you're not either, because the EIEIO of who comes to see you doesn't have to be a singular focused voice from one business entity, because I want to hear from the wine industry, and I want to hear from the farmers, and I hope they want to hear from the soft drink industry, and I want to hear from my pastor, and I want to hear from the school district. So let's be careful when we say we have to put everybody into one big bunch for representation. Let's allow everybody to have their own voice in the same way. To that point, the question about what's, what's getting in the way of economic development that I see is simply this, and it, and it is disparity of agenda in, in rural Oregon. And if you put on a map the poorest counties, including Malheur, if you went to Josephine, if you went to Curry County, you would find that in every case, those counties have at least as much public ownership of the land as they do private. So when you talk about disparity of agenda, you have to think about who is in control, who are the stakeholders that control the destiny within that county. 
So when we go talk about how are we going to do things in far eastern Oregon or how are we going to do things in Klamath or Lake County, we have another constituency who has a different agenda than local economic development. So I think for all of us, when we think about not only our statewide representation and how we think about things like land use, how does that impact all the stakeholders or how does it impact the stakeholders who are most adversely affected? So we have to think through those questions constantly and, and that applies to rules of law. We, we heard conversation about do we have rules of law that are you know, business friendly? Let's just say they're not adverse. That would be my first measurement as a legislator. Is this business friendly? Well, let's just say, is it not adverse? So I think those things when we're talking to and we're, and we're going to advocate our position as rural economy drivers to the legislature or to the federal government, we've got to talk about those things that allow us a little bit of flexibility in rural Oregon for development beyond those constraints that sometimes are applied to us by the, by the adverse uh, position or agenda that we face. I have to just add one more thing. We're, we're big in transportation, so I, I love the idea of making a transportation corridor. We've talked a little bit about, um, about Coos County, about the port in Coos Bay. I think the port of Coos Bay is the most underdeveloped gym in the state of Oregon right now. And if you go to Coos Bay and you look at the available property around there, and if we could build out the transportation infrastructure, in, including the rail line, and, 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 it, and it's a nasty word among many people, but a freeway so that you can get freight back and forth from there to the I-5 corridor, you could have a West Coast juggernaut when it comes to economic development. And you want to go to a county that could look and see a lot of opportunity in economic development, Coos County would be one of those. But thank you, Representative, for having me. Well, thank, thank you very much, Bruce. And uh, of course, Oregon does not have a, an official state carbonated beverage. Um, but I know you to be a keen observer of the legislative process. Do you happen to know what our new state bird might be, one of the two new state birds? Uh, the osprey. The osprey is, is our new state raptor. And the meadowlark is our official state songbird. So well done. Well, our final panelist, Jason Lewis Berry, serves in the office of Governor Kate Brown as advisor on, econ on uh, economy and jobs as well as director of regional solutions, which is an economic development and community development program with field uh, staff based across the entire state. Before returning recently to Oregon, Jason served in a senior position in the U.S. Department of State, focused on building resilient communities abroad. Prior to his federal service, he worked for a humanitarian relief organization in Africa and as a consultant on homeland security and disaster preparation in Washington, D.C. Uh, and he has also worked uh, before that in film production and as a journalist. So uh, Jason, welcome to the, uh, the program today. You have a slightly different perspective on the challenges outside the I-5 corridor. What can you share with us? Thanks, Representative. Here we are. All right. Thanks, Representative. Appreciate it. Uh, happy to be here. And I know uh, we are on the countdown to cocktails, so I will try to keep this moving, especially since I'm number seven of seven, I think, in terms of answering the question about what are the challenges, I should probably just say ditto uh, what all these guys said. But I will maybe add just a little bit of uh, flavor to what we've heard already mentioned by my co-panelists. So I've been traveling all around the state. I've been on the job now for about five months. And fortunately, uh, when I came in to this job, it was actually already a couple of weeks into session. And fortunately, the governor and the chief of staff said, you know what, why don't you focus first on getting around the state and seeing what's going on? Uh, really make sure you get to know the different economic challenges and opportunities in the many different regions of Oregon. And we'll kind of cover session for you. So I appreciated that. Uh, in February when they said it, and I appreciated it even more in June and July when I saw the home stretch on session. But the two things that I heard the most uh, when I was traveling around the state and asking people, what are the biggest obstacles that you're hitting on economic development? Number one was housing. So Patrick and I think others have touched on that. The phrase that, that we're using is workforce housing. So it is distinct from a lot of the conversation that you hear in some of the urban areas 
where it's more about affordable housing, also a big issue, so not meaning to diminish that. But what we're hearing in some of the rural towns is that you have companies with good jobs that would pay good family wages, and they can't fill their positions because people who would accept those jobs can't find a place to live for them and their family. So it's more of a stock and inventory issue than it is an affordability issue. So that's one thing that we've been looking at. And secondly, also touched on by a number of folks, is workforce development. And uh, as someone who was out of the state after growing up here, being, being away for about 20 years, one of the first things that I noticed in, in having these conversations was that it might have been uh, my generation that was kind of the last to have Votech uh, growing up in Oregon. It seems to have largely disappeared for a while and maybe just picked up in the last five years ago, uh, last five years or so, because there are some pretty innovative programs happening at the high school and community college level around the state. I've seen them uh, in everywhere from Pendleton to Medford and places in between. So I'm encouraged by some of the innovation and some of the partnerships. For example, in the Rogue Valley, they had a great partnership between the business community and the education community on this. Uh, but clearly, there's a pipeline problem because uh, it was kind of quiet there for, for 15 or 20 years. So those are two uh, challenges. And then just maybe an anecdote about some of the things that I found encouraging. Uh, I was not that long ago out on the coast, and actually some of our friends from Florence are here. I see Aaron, the city manager, and, and Jesse, who works out there as well. Uh, one of the things that I think people had you know, really some foresight to do in the last couple of years is make sure that we spread some of our support off the I-5 corridor on things like entrepreneurship. So many of you are probably familiar with uh, RAIN, uh, the Regional Accelerator and Innovation Network that, of course, has hubs in, in Eugene and Corvallis. But also, they have now spread out to cover the coast. And this event that I was at maybe about a month ago was celebrating some of the uh, good work that uh, they've done out there to accelerate some of the, the businesses. There was great energy, uh, really some promising startups, and also nice kind of collaboration, not only between the public sector and these innovators, but also other members of that community. It's a big uh, retiree community, and you had folks who had long experience in their industries who were now mentoring entrepreneurs in that region. So I found that very encouraging. And I did not know that Jesse would be here today, but I brought this to show off one of those products. And so he does happen to be here. Raise your hand. There you go. So Jesse is one of those entrepreneurs who uh, has this product out now called Stony River Sinkers, which is stone fishing sinkers. So rather than lead, for a number of reasons, including environmental, but also performance, these are better. Uh, so I just thought that this was one of the, the coolest things that I saw. And uh, I really didn't know you'd be here. But uh, I'll take my cut later. No, just kidding. <laughs> so thank you. Excellent. Ex Jesse, I, I've seen your sinkers. You're making them like out of uh, the um, leftover parts of marble countertops. And they make great earrings, too. <laughs> yeah, do, you, do you happen to know what the state rock is? <laughs> uh, it's the Thunder Egg. The Thunder Egg is our Oregon State Rock. But I, I, but I, I would be remiss if I didn't challenge Jason to a question. Jason, um, um, you, uh, you're living uh, in Salem in, uh, in the heart of Marion County. Do you happen to know what our new Oregon State pie is? Well, f first, I do have to clarify, I'm not living in Salem, although I am spending a lot of time there. But uh, yeah, it's Marionberry. The Marionberry pie. <laughs> there you are. <laughs> All right. Uh, enough lighthearted questions about Oregon State symbols. I'm going to ask some provocative questions, and I'm going to ask anybody who wants to to reach for a microphone. These are questions that, uh, that were submitted to us by uh, one of the, uh, at least one of the, uh, the seven panelists. And here's one that got my attention. The minimum wage increase has a differential wage for different parts of Oregon, um, for urban and rural, just to simplify the, the wage differential. Do you see other areas of policy or regulation where we should be looking at treating different parts of the state differently? Who wants to jump in on that one first? Please, Bruce. <laughs> well, yeah, y yes. I mean, absolutely. It's part of the, it's part of the adversity that I'm talking about, and, and if you bring it down to land use as an example, um, land use disparity in terms of the amount available property to be developed, um, lots of times as a legislator we would have conversations about 
property tax and property tax rate. And I, and I would say to somebody from metro areas, pick a rate you would like a rural county to pay. Just, just pick one. And it doesn't matter if you double it, triple it, quadruple it, you still can't generate enough money to provide basic services. But a lot of the disparity then is because of land use rules that don't allow for development of privately held land, we can't get the development, the growth, the building in order to generate additional tax revenue. So that's just one. But I think, again, every time we make a decision, both federally and at, at, the, at the Oregon legislative level, we have to ask ourselves, who does this impact most? While the microphone's down at that end of the table, Grant, I'm going to put you on the spot because you're, you're operating your businesses essentially in the, the Boise uh, urban area. Um, again, the question was, if we have different minimum wages in different parts of Oregon, are there other regulations that would, uh, where it would make some sense to have different standards in different parts of the state? Yes, I, I, I'm, yes. I kind of touched on the, the, the fact of, uh, of uh, maybe with our new economic region, we could try with the Department of Human Services to, you know, allow people to work seasonally without losing their um, uh, entitlements. For one, I mean, I know people. It's a small town. It's a small area. There are people that come to work, and I need their help. And they say I can work 30 hours or 32. Why? You, would you do? You want to work more? Yes, but I'll lose my housing allowance or my grocery allowance and. It's terrible. It's just working against you. Um, I'm, I'm going to tell you what else. I, I, you know, after this snowmageddon, because there's such a disparity between us and Idaho, and I, I can't even name all the th things. Whether it's income tax rates are lower, um, and uh, uh, other labor issues. Um, two of uh, my competitors from Mount Here County are rebuilding their sheds in Idaho. It's just like three miles from where they were. And I'll tell you, we've lost, uh, we're going to lose property taxes, we're going to lose income taxes, um, and we can't afford to do that. So we have to be friendlier in a lot of ways to uh, stay competitive. And we're right on the border. We see it happen. It's not like, uh, you know, you can, it, and we're, there aren't very many businesses. So um, we have to do what we can. And uh, fortunately, we have this economic region now, and hopefully we can fix things. Anybody else want to touch on this interesting question? I actually have a point there. Um, it looks definitely on the rural life situation, specifically on generation and generational change in operation. Uh, my farm's going through that right now from fourth to fifth generation, uh, and it's becoming more <coughs> difficult than ever for generations, the new generation, next generation to, to take over. And one of the, I guess, major barriers to entry there for someone like me, a young farmer who's eager to grow up farming with his grandfather and dad and, and you know and you hear the stories of how it all happened and you want to become that next harper that's taken over that farm uh it, it the estate tax detail has been really really challenging for us uh it's it's challenging for my father or my great my grandfather and then my father's ground and then which would become my ground to then uh essentially hand that over without having to incur a large tax. And essentially that tax is on me. Um, it's hundreds of thousands of dollars right now looking at my dad's basically net worth. I mean, his ass in all in assets, it has nothing to do with, with cash. Um, but, uh, you know, farmer is the one thing, you don't necessarily go in agriculture expecting a large salary. That's just not the way it is. Um, you're certainly wealthy in, ath in assets and uh, uh, that's essentially what agriculture is. And you might have nice equipment and things, but that's because you're either going to pay lots of tax or you're going to buy new tractors or maybe put uh, a new shop in for your, for your help to be able to, uh, to work in in the wintertime, especially one like this last winter. Uh, but estate tax is something that's been really challenging for us right now. And there's a, actually a lot of farms. There's a reason why some farms end up being bought out by the neighbor and then get larger and larger. They're still a family farm, but they're, g they're gaining ground because there's somebody selling out because they're not willing to do what it takes, which is a very complicated process to potentially move that soil to that next generation. So uh, that, that's something that needs to be addressed for these family operations that I say like myself, we've been in Junction City for 130 years and that ground we've owned forever. And we've been stewards of that soil and have taken very, very good care of that soil and are making it produce better than ever. Um, we're seeing double the yields in 
uh, on the east side there on, on, on onions alone, and we're seeing double in hazelnuts here in, in the valley uh, alone, uh, not to mention any other of the, you know, potential 220 plus crops we have. So um, that's a major growing pain for myself and my family, um, and it's really expensive for us, which keeps talk about being competitive. Uh, that's taking away from our competitive edge in in the market because agriculture is an enterprise whether we like it or not It is now an enterprise because we're we're shipping everywhere not just here, but globally so All right. Excellent. Well, I'm going to move us along the questions become progressively harder as um, we move through the uh, the list the decline in rural economies has dire consequences on communities including severe social problems in my own community, 25% um, uh, of our school children are categorized as homeless. And almost every kid in our school qualifies for free or reduced meals. Are there any examples of how your communities are building a collaborative culture with city, county, state, private sector, philanthropy, or ports where people are willing to pull together to make things happen? Um, we're looking for some examples of how uh, collaborative efforts uh, address some of the social problems that result in stressed communities. Steve. Yeah, I, I have a great, great example here, something that is really novel, that Ken Wright, the owner of Ken Wright <coughs> Winery, a very well-known winery here in Oregon, and some others in the Amhill Carlton AVA right nearby here, put together where they partnered with Chemeketa Community College, which has a great wine program, evening courses, things like that, where people can become winemakers at nights and on weekends. But they collaborated with the Yamhill uh, Carleton High School so that students can uh, basically, uh, they have their own vineyard on campus and they can learn grape growing and get college level credit while they're still in high school, which I think is a really great way to foster the kind of talent we need in our industry and our industry that talent level is a really important challenge for us. We continually need to bring more and more outsiders into this state, and it's great for us to be able to produce that kind of talent um, organically. Please, Larry. Um, yeah, this, uh, I think, for the seafood industry and the fishing industry in general is a really critical issue. Um, it's in terms of being able to really build an understanding of the importance of fishing in coastal communities. Um, it's the collaboration at the community level and the interest and support of the ports um, and the towns is really critical um, and the uh, universities and institutions in the communities is really critical to um, building a culture of education. Um, there's a lot of um, misinformation and propaganda out there about um, fishing and um, the potential effects of fishing and a lot of lack of understanding about how important the industry is to the communities. Um, and I, you know, just in terms of being able to support this industry in the communities, I think it's really critical. We are lucky here in Oregon. Um, we have a lot of that support um, within the communities and the institutions. We've heard about um, OSU expanding their marine science initiative. Um, the Charleston Marine, Li marine Life Center um, has an aquarium and educational exhibits. Um, the Oregon Institute of Marine Biology has an exhibit on the seafood industry. Um, and it overlooks a commercial dock. It's just, I think, really important, um, especially in terms of educating the public and um, the rest of the people within the community and the next generation um, to really build that support from within the community. I think I'd be remiss if I didn't mention one of the most collaborative programs that I see in Southern Oregon, and it's in a number of the communities that we serve, is Boys and Girls Club. And, and I say that because as an employer and, and of a lot of young people um, with children, having an opportunity for those kids to be somewhere both after school that sometimes provides the meal they wouldn't get if they were a, a latchkey kid, sometimes pr provides the, the homework assistance or study assistance that they need after school, and also school summer or summer school programs that allow their parents to work throughout the year. 
I see a whole lot of employers who look to those type of collaborative programs that allow them to have employees and have their children in a place that's trusted and uh, provides both educational and nutritional uh, opportunities. So I think that's a great collaborative opportunity. Patrick. Uh, yeah, so I joined the Tillamook community five years ago and I've been <laughs> really overwhelmed and, and humbled by that community's commitment to addressing its, its own so social issues. And where I've seen it be, uh, where I've seen the efforts be really powerful is when you've got uh, a partnership between the communities, local and state government, uh, businesses, and then um, increasingly uh, nonprofits and and the the statewide uh, community foundations. I saw Ann here earlier from Ford Fa Ford Foundation. So, um, and and I think th those types of partnerships can yield. Uh, tremendous results. A couple of examples in Tillamook, uh, the way that folks are working together uh, on the housing on housing issues, um, the Year Wellness Initiative uh, to to address the uh, sort of epidemic health and wellness uh, issues that you know we face across the state and across the country, uh, frankly. And so, you know, when I spoke earlier about um, the advantages of uh, of life and business in, in rural Oregon, I think that 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 uh, community commitment is one of those tremendous advantages where uh, in these small communities where folks have known each other for generations um, the, and, and the fact that they, you know, they live, work, and play in these areas and are planning to do so for, for a long time, their commitment uh, uh, is, is tremendous and the partnerships is where, is where things really get done, Prioritiz prioritizing key issues and partnering. Excellent. Well, I'm going to add my own observation, if I may. You know, I spoke earlier about the fact that 25% of the population in my district is over the age of 65. And very often people think about retirees as being a burden on, the community, on a community when in fact they are the exact opposite of that. Uh, they are people who have a lifetime of experience. They often have expendable income. Uh, they've got certainly time to contribute back into their communities and they do so by getting involved in all kinds of projects, whether it's the arts or whether it's education, whether it's programs like Backpack for Kids or after school programs or mentoring other emerging businesses. And I think one of the, uh, the real assets that we have in a lot of our rural communities are the uh, the retirees that are there that uh, that add to the richness and the breadth and uh, and the diversity of our communities and uh, all all our contributors back to uh, to that community so let me move on to another question I think this is a, a great question and I'm looking forward to some answers uh, to it based on your participation in your respective national and international industry organizations what is the most interesting rural economic development project, policy, strategy, or initiative that you've learned about that you'd like Oregons and locals to learn more about? What have you seen that really got your attention and said, boy, we should take that idea back home? Um, so I'd like to talk a minute. Um, I'll take this opportunity to uh, let everybody know about um, the Oregon uh, Industry Rockfish Marketing Initiative. Um, this is a new uh, collaboration. It's actually called the Groundfish Market Development Initiative. Um, it is a collaboration between the Oregon Trawl Commission, um, or, uh, Oregon Department of Agriculture, uh, several uh, seafood processing companies and the Environmental Defense Fund. Um, so we've got government, we've got industry, we've got NGOs, um, we, are, uh, we have the Marine Stewardship Council involved, and um, the project has been funded um, to focus on uh, generating interest and demand for West Coast rockfish. Um, we have here in um, on the West Coast uh, some incredibly healthy rebuilt robust, sustainable fish stocks that really, um, and this is coming from somebody who lived, I lived my whole life on the East Coast. I'm amazed at how healthy and robust the stocks on the West Coast are. It's something really to celebrate. Um, the sacrifices that the fishermen made to rebuild those stocks, though, um, pretty much took us out of the rockfish market for the last 15 years. Um, and now nobody eats rockfish, everybody eats tilapia and swai. Yuck. Um, so, 
just next time you belly up to a plate of tilapia, um, remember that you could be eating West Coast rockfish instead. Um, so we are in the process now um, of a major marketing initiative. It's really just getting off the ground, but it's very exciting. It's, um, like I said, it's you know multi, all different interest groups involved, and we're really gonna make a huge push for getting people, not just in Oregon, but up and down the West Coast and throughout the whole country um, to remember how good rockfish is and to really try to promote it. We have tens of millions of pounds of rockfish that we can harvest every year. We just need to find a market for it. Interesting. Well, there's a good uh, rockfish example. I was thinking of a, uh, uh, a very um, <laughs> Um, high profile free media opportunity we had recently just north of Newport to market hagfish. <laughs> well, how, many, how many of you had heard of hagfish before they spilled it all over 101? Okay, all right. Well, I'm looking for other great examples of marketing programs that you've seen other places that we need to bring back home and give a try here. Well, well I'll tell you real quick, it's, I'm not so much so marketing from the from the pure business perspective, but uh, the Coca-Cola company and Coca-Cola bottlers throughout the United States, uh, Coca-Cola Bottlers Association, as part of that cooperative, one of the one of the most outstanding programs that, that I'm the proudest of to be a participant is called the Coca-Cola Scholars Program. So while it's not a direct business, it is a direct educational benefit, it's one of the largest privately funded scholar programs in the country. Um, it's not just here we go, let's fund somebody to go to college, because they take that group of people and, and inter introduce them to volunteer work. They introduce them into a lifestyle of giving back to their community. And if you go back and look at the history of Coca-Cola scholars across the country, uh, they're now ambassadors, they're attorneys, they're doctors, they're all these things, but they all come back to, this is where I started, this is where I learned about giving back to my community. So I'm really proud that the company has said from a global perspective, bringing this to, the, to our country and saying, let's get them an education, but let's also teach them how to use it and give it back in the community. And it's really been a tremendous program. And I believe, uh, I'm correct in saying, every independent Coca-Cola bottler in the country contributes to that scholarship program. So it is a collaborative process and it's a really successful education program. Excellent. Jason. This isn't just a, a marketing opportunity, but I, th I think um, I think we should double down on on CLT. Uh, so we've been talking about this for a few years in Oregon. Uh, so cross laminated timber, mass timber. I'm sure most of you already heard about this, and in a way, it is something we picked up from elsewhere because that industry has been moving for some time in Europe and Canada. And Oregon, you know, leaned forward on this starting a few years ago with some executive orders and then some great industry leadership. Uh, of course, we have the only CLT manufacturer in the US and DR Johnson down in Riddle. And uh, I was just down there a couple weeks ago and I, I just think that uh, we had a first mover advantage in the way that we worked on some of our codes in this state and the way that you know people frankly like Valerie Johnson and DR Johnson have, have seized the space and made the investment. And I don't want Oregon to lose that first mover advantage because now we're seeing this being talked about all over the country. There's new plants being planned in, in other states. So there's a lot of aspects to this. We need to increase our manufacturing capacity. We need to have the continued kind of demonstration effect of the buildings that are getting built. And I think we need to do a better job of making it clear that mass timber is about rural economic development, even if you see the building go up in Portland. Uh, the assembly of these things is a relatively small job by a small crew over a few days. The economic impact is in places like Riddle. So I'd like to see us really double down. Um, I just wanted to add really quickly, for anybody going to the reception tonight, um, the chairman, I'm sorry, the president of the Oregon Trawl Commission will be serving rockfish. <laughs> I just wanted to also point out one more thought that occurred to me, and, and uh, I think it's a great opportunity. It's something that's already being done in this state, but it's a great opportunity for other industries to po possibly look at. And that's, you've seen these great uh, Oregon wine country license plates. That was a first ever program for the wine industry in America, and some of the, uh, quite a bit of the funding that comes from that goes to local communities to, uh, 
for local community grants to drive sensible agritourism so it spreads those dollars all over the state in places where they can be of real value and there's great opportunities in other products. I haven't seen very many examples of that in our state. I think it's a big opportunity. Well, speaking of license plates, um, just yesterday, um, Bruce Mate from the uh, Marine Mammal Institute in Newport uh, went to Salem to approve the final production proof of an Oregon Coast license plate. Uh, part of uh, I saw Arnie chuckling because he knows it's been a four-year process to uh, to get us to this point, but but those will soon be available to uh, to front and rear uh, bumpers near you. I've got. One last question that I'm going to present to the group, um, and it's a question not on the list, but I was listening to the comments as we began the presentation today, and one of the challenges that I heard so many people refer to was the question of workforce. And closely related to workforce was the question of housing. And the simple fact that as we're looking for employees, particularly up and down the coast where you see help wanted signs everywhere, that people who want to work at the coast can't find a place to live at the coast that they can afford. Now, in my own community, we face a unique challenge because about a third of the housing in, uh, in my city, my city are homes that people live in. And about a third of the houses there are second homes, vacation homes that people frequent uh, several times a year, which leaves about a third of the homes which are in the nightly rental pool. And part of the challenge we face is if somebody's got an available piece of land or wants to sell a home, what of those three is going to generate the best rate of return? What's going to be the most profitable in our market if you have a choice between vacation homes, retirement homes, or residential homes? Uh, so the question is, how do we overcome market challenges to encourage people to produce the kind of housing that, uh, that is in such dire need up and down the coast and in our rural communities right now? I told you the questions got harder as the night went on. So. Yeah, I just heard one of my co-panelists say, who has the answer to that? <laughs> uh, not me yet, but we are working on it. Uh, so I, I, I'll tell you a little bit about what we're doing uh, from the, the state's angle. Uh, I've been convening through the Regional Solutions Mechanism, which many of you are familiar with that program, uh, cabinet agencies to put together a pilot to get at this workforce housing problem. Uh, we've had some really useful discussions with developers, because uh, obviously the problem here is that basically the market doesn't build in, in a lot of rural areas. It doesn't pencil out. Uh, and uh, really a particularly fruitful one just about a month ago with employers. So folks, frankly, somebody from Tillamook Creamery was there, one of Patrick's colleagues, and about 10 other companies from around the state who are facing this challenge. And what we're going to do, we're pretty close to having a, a design that we're going to put out and kind of offer uh, or invite communities to uh, envision and send us an idea about a, a public-private partnership where employers will lean forward a bit to put, a little, put some skin in the game, local jurisdictions will lean in a little bit, and the state will also put skin in the game. And we hope that that will shrink the margin enough so that developers can uh, go ahead and lean forward, take on a little more risk, and get some building going in some of these, these more rural communities where workforce housing is a challenge. The intent would be if we pilot this in a few communities, that we see what works and what doesn't, and then we can come with a bigger program, go to legislature for an ask, and see uh, where that takes us. Any other thoughts on the housing challenge? Well, let me then conclude with this. Um, Folks, we've got some, we've got, a, uh, I said, an A-list panel up here today. And these are people who work in or represent s successful businesses, remarkably successful businesses. But that's where they are today, and they weren't always at that point. And each of these remarkably successful businesses began as a concept and then an entrepreneurial ex uh, exploration. They started small and they grew. I mean, we're here in Oregon where Nike began in somebody's, uh, uh, on somebody's waffle iron in the kitchen, and Intel began in somebody's garage, and, uh, and Leatherman began on somebody's garage uh, workbench. And I'm convinced that the next Intel, Nike, Leatherman is out there in, uh, in our rural communities where, frankly, it's easier than ever to be successful because unlike 30, 40, 50 years ago, now you can get started with 
an internet connection, a FedEx delivery or pickup, and, uh, and a little bit of, uh, of financing. And I think that if we want to talk about one of the tools that we have to move forward in our rural communities, it is empowering the entrepreneurial sector empowering creativity, those people that are out there that start with little more than a crazy idea and some creativity and some raw economic courage and want to go out and create a sustainable future for themselves and their families and for the people that are going to be working for them down the road. So I think that's one other answer to the kind of challenges that we've been talking about today. So I want to thank the panel. I want to thank them for sharing their expertise and their experience with all of you. I want to thank all of you for bearing with us. I want to remind you that uh, a taste of Oregon is right around the corner where you can experience some other wonderfully successful Oregon businesses. Are there any other questions before we adjourn? Then thank you all for being with us this afternoon.